Good morning, everyone. Um, hope you all had fun yesterday, and glad to see most everyone made it back. So um, I know the other speakers have slightly touched on this, so I'll go over this pretty quickly. But agent-based modeling is sort of a version of, of computer simulation. It is a way of doing simulating. It's not the only way, um, but it does have some really great advantages. And some of the great advantages are that you can basically make an agent into anything. So this Wikipedia definition here, agents as objects, that's from programming. But if you're a social scientist, you should probably switch that around and say objects as agents. So anything can be an agent. Um, I once did a model where I needed to make it rain. And so my agents were raindrops. Um, you can basically, anything that's an object, you can turn into an agent. And then you can have the agents interact with each other or interact with an environment. Um, usually the environment is other agents as well. And so it allows you to sort of simulate things with lots of different, th lots of different components happening. And the idea is that emergence happens. So you put a bunch of agents together, you give them some rules, you see how they interact with each other, and it might lead to more complex interactions, more complex things. Um, I think basically the other two speakers have given really good examples of agents sort of combining to create cultures, as it were, um, or learning. And those are pretty good examples there. And so that is basically what agent-based modeling is. This idea is to use agents to go towards very complex um, processes. We're not quite there. So um, a little brief history. Um, 1970s happen. Computers happen. Everyone's like, yes, simulation. This is going to be awesome. And it didn't really take off. So um, there's about 10 papers in the 1980s on simulation archaeology. There's about 10 papers in the 1990s on simulation archaeology. And in the last two or three years, we've matched that or doubled it. Um, so agent-based modeling is sort of becoming an interesting topic in archaeology at this point. Um, so this is a paper that just came out, sort of matched out 50-some uh, papers over the last 15 years. Um, as you can see, the trend is upward. Lots of archaeologists are doing agent-based modeling. Um, I kind of feel this is, might be a slight misrepresentation. There are more archaeologists now than there were in the 1980s and 90s and 70s, so you would expect the number of papers to go up, um, but this is quite a jump. So we are now starting to do a lot more agent-based modeling in archaeology. But is that actually a good thing? So uh, there are certain programs that we use to do it. So there's uh, sort of general ones. There's Repass, there's Mason, there's NetLogo. These are sort of the three main programs that you use agent-based modeling. Um, unfortunately, pretty much almost all the models that we end up doing is bespoke. Most models in, um, that we've been doing in archaeology tend to be created by ourselves. So we go out, and if we know Java or if we know Python, um, we basically create our very own agent-based modeling program. And almost none of the literature, no one takes someone else's program. So even if someone puts it in that logo, very few people take someone else's model and reuse it. So essentially, almost every time we're doing agent-based modeling, we're basically reinventing the wheel. And we're not really improving that wheel too much. <laughs> so um, th these are two papers at CAA International, 20 years apart. Nothing really has changed. Uh, in 20 years, we've now gone from just North America to the globe, but the resolution's actually gone down slightly. So um, I, I don't really want. I, I feel bad for trying to call out other people's work on this. And I'm sure they're doing thing, great things, um, but they were both doing very similar things. So basically, two people created models that were very similar, 20 years apart. And this kind of captures what we've been doing in agent-based modeling. Uh, what we did 20 years ago tends to be what we were doing today. Um, and so this is, I'd say this is not a criticism, but this is an observation because uh, it's a bit unfair. But we also happen to concentrate most of our modeling into very specific areas. So um, we really like modeling the Neolithic. I mean, like, really, really like it. Um, <laughs> And these are all models that are created separately 
and slightly tweaked, so they get slightly different um, results. But we end up with a lot of interest in very specific areas. Um, one is migration. Almost, I'd say most agent-based modeling tends to be about you know spread of this to somewhere else, spread of that, people, places, things, ideas, whatever. Um, it tends to be sort of a cl clustering. And I don't mean this as a criticism, because fair enough, if that's what you're interested in, that's what you're interested in. Um, basically, I'm not quite interested in that, so I'm not going to do something on that. But you know, we tend to have sort of focused on a very narrow area. And most of our models tend to be aiming at very old stuff. Um, basically, medieval, modern, industrial, almost nothing. Um, there's an occasional one having to do with a, you know, a battle or history, you know, military history, um, but we have not concentrated these models. We have not used agent-based modeling anywhere but basically a couple of thousand years ago. Um, I think there's some reasons behind that, and it's a bit difficult, um, but you know, it is just sort of an observation that we're basically concentrating all our effort and repeating that effort over and over again in a very small area of archaeology. And probably the greatest criticism um, of agent-based modeling, and this has been since the 1970s, and pretty much any review you read, this is basically going to be the number one thing, is models are too simple. We tend to make very simple models. Um, and there's, there's some people who actually sort of push that way. So the idea is actually if you only have one or two factors, you should use math. Um, I know some mathematicians who would definitely argue against that and say that definitely multiple uh, variables happen, but this tends to hold true is at most, whenever we're doing agent-based modeling, we only model maybe at max a dozen different variables per model. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. We kind of keep them very simple, very one or two variables, maybe a couple. And we use modeling more as sort of a sketch. We use modeling as sketching out our ideas. We try out the ideas. We keep it very simple. It's, it's basically, um, most agent-based modeling is we pull out a piece of paper, pen, we sketch out some ideas. We tend to do that with modeling. They're very simple models. We sort of sketch out the ideas that we have. Um, but I'm not sure if we're really pushing the boundaries. There are, of course, exceptions to this. Um, so in the Anasazi area, basically the project's been going on for 15 years. And that's 15 years of people building up Han models. So it's not just one model. It's a first model. And then someone else took that data and changed it slightly. They added another component to it. And basically, it's taken 15 years. But this is probably a really good example of a fairly complex model that allows you to look at different things. It looks at political, social, um, rain, water, resources. And it's actually a whole cluster of different models. Um, this is one of the few examples where people are, are reusing the code and reusing models um, in a group as opposed to going out and creating our very own models. And um, so I always suspected this, but it, it still really hurt when I realized I was an idiot. Um, and modeling helped me figure that out. Um, basically, how we do models is we program the agents. And the models will only be as good as we can program them. So they're as only as good as our programming skills, and they're only as good as we are able to conceptualize how a model or an agent should interact. So there's a lot of pressure on us to be really, really good. Um, and after doing several years of agent-based modeling, I realized I'm not good. Um, and that, that is reflected in my models. So it's, it's very hard um, when we're basically creating models and we have to go out and program every single skill into it. Every different variable you want to program, you have to do yourself. And that's how we have been doing it, um, though we tend to repeat that over and over again and not share um, how we do that. So there is a shortcut. There is a way we can get very, very complex models quite quickly. Um, and that is to use something like machine learning. So in theory, instead of us being the brains behind our agents and having them work and having them interact, we could give them a brain themselves and then we observe and we see what happens. 
Um, it doesn't really work. Uh, when you gave an agent uh, a brain, they tend to be smarter than you. Um, so a perfect example was I was using some uh, basically learning algorithms. I was looking to get an agent from one point to another. And it ran a couple of times, and then it stopped, and then it would just take one turn. And I couldn't figure it. It was like magic. It would go from one end of the, the globe to the other, and that was it, one turn. It took me about two or three weeks to realize I had not turned off global uh, world. So basically, it went around the backwards. It just it found the quickest route, which was to cheat and go the other direction and come all the way around. Um, if you've ever used uh, basically any sort of you know, learning algorithms or anything like that, you'll quickly realize that it will find a way to do it, but it's usually not the way you want it to do it. <laughs> but it's not actually necessarily a bad thing. So um, when I was younger, um, it was 4th of July. Uh, I asked my parents, well, how did we win the Revolutionary War? And they responded, well, we cheated. <laughs> we hid behind rocks, and we picked off the British while they were all lined up in nice little lines with red coats so they were easy to see. As a kid, it was a bit disappointing to kind of realize that we had cheated to win. But then I went outside, and I watched the fireworks, and I was OK after that. And I kind of think that that's not necessarily a bad thing when a model cheats. So in a sense, if we were to try to model a revolutionary war, we would hope that any sort of learning algorithm would learn to cheat and you know, hide behind rocks and do guerrilla warfare. And so um, that's what you want to do. But trying to program cheating is super hard. Um, and this is, this is going back to why I don't think we've had many models in the last, you know, covering the last 2,000 years. When you have a lot of history and you have a lot of different things that need to happen, it's really, really hard. I suspect uh, the reason we're not doing industrial stuff or anything modern is it's really tough. Um, there's a bit of fear there. I mean, you really have to work on stuff. If you were trying to model um, the Revolutionary War, in my mind, I actually can't conceptualize how I'd go about doing that. So it's very hard. But it is interesting that if we do give our models brains, they will find things that will cheat. And those actually might be a good thing. Um, one real problem, though, is if you're using any sort of machine learning, it depends on what you're using. But if you can really hard to figure out why they did what they did, they'll find a route, or you know, if that's what you're doing, if you're trying to you know, least cost path, they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll figure out the best way to do it. Um, but it's really hard to go back and figure out why they did that. It's, hard. it's really almost, a lot of times when you do machine learning, it ends up being a black box. And a black box can be really horrible. So uh, this is Google, who does tons of machine learning. And of course, with their images, they at one point ended up um, basically tagging black people as gorillas, which, as you can imagine, was incredibly offensive and exploded in Google's face. Um, but when you're doing machine learning, they couldn't, you can't check for that stuff. It happens, and it's really hard to figure out why that happened, and what it was doing, and how to correct it, and how to add a lot of different sort of cultural um, aspects that will make a change. So that kind of leaves us with sort of two choices. Um, one is we can either beat Google, or um, basically we can get better at grinding out um, models, and that is, well, I think most people would think get better at grinding. Um, I don't think that might be the best way forward. Um, I think we may have to look at machine learning and figure out ways to make it work. Um, if not, I think we're probably going to have to look at getting better at what we do now. And that means sharing code and setting standards. Um, so there are there is a new thing to push for standards in archaeology um, agent-based modeling. But we really have to get better at sharing code and reusing models. Um, I feel like we've reinvented the wheel over and over again. Um, and now it's time to work on suspension or windows or something else on the car. Um, I'm a little conflicted about this. Um, I think teaching archaeologists ABM is a great thing. I think teaching archaeologists anything is a great thing. Um, though I'm not sure if teaching more people to use ABM is really a solution in that if we teach people to use ABM and if they just keep doing what we've been doing for the last 20 years, we're wasting people's time. 
So I'm a bit conflicted about that, but I do, I do see lots of value in teaching people at least the, the knowledge and the skills to understand what other people are doing uh, when they're using agent-based modeling. And that means we also need to sort of have a fundamentally change in how we do archaeology. Um, so this might not translate across, but that's the Lone Ranger. So kind of how we've been doing agent-based modeling now is you go out by yourself, usually in a room, stuck with a computer, and you program, and you make your model. And that's it. It's, it's very rarely a team effort. Um, there are some great exceptions, and I think that's better, but we really need to be moving towards really large projects. If we want to get very complex models and we want to have multiple variables, you need to have different people working on different variables and be able to put that back together. Um, so that's kind of the challenges we're looking at right there, is basically we either have to figure out a way to make machine learning work so we can go really complex fast, or we have to figure out a way to work better as agent-based modelers, um, share code, work as teams. So uh, a perfect example is the paper from CERN which had a thousand authors. Um, I mean, that's incredible. But when you think about it, they were dealing with physics, which have much, much less complicated than trying to deal with the past and recreating past cultures. So I would, not just, I would hope that in you know, a couple of years we'd have a 10,000 author paper. Um, but that's, that's what you'd have to do if, to do with the current things, how we basically program stuff, how we cr create different variables. We need a lot of people working on this. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of our two choices. So implicit in this, um, this whole talk, I apologize for not starting out with this, but basically I've been saying that complex is the way we need to go. That's what agent-based modeling does. But does it? So um, if it isn't broke, do we need to fix it? Does it? Can it be just a tool to help sort of work through different um, ideas? Can it be very simple? Is this something personal that we use? Um, so most every, every one person here probably has a smartphone that has more computing power than NASA had to put a man on the moon. And probably most of us use it to text. <laughs> but that's the same thing with computers. There's a lot of potential with agent-based modeling. But lots of people are just happy with a computer that does word processing. Most people use a computer as a sort of fancy notepad and pen. There are slight advantages, but what you could really do with a computer is so much more. I wonder if that's the question we'd be asking about agent-based modeling. There's the potential to do so much more with it, but do we really want to? I mean, if a computer works for 99% of the people as just a nice word processing machine, why change? So that's pretty much how I'm going to end this with a question. <laughs>